the church. Once again, we come to uh, Peter's letter to the Christian church. So we've been on a bit of a journey so far. Uh, we've looked at this living hope that we have as Christians and this joy that we feel as well. So far we've looked at living as strangers in the world. So again, we, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. You know, we're currently walking through this existence, but we don't, just, we don't really feel at home here because this is not our eternal home. You know, we know that our heavenly home awaits us. So we've looked at how we live as strangers in the world. Uh, we've also looked at uh, being the elect of God. You know, so we've been called out of the world, chosen out of the world. Uh, to this living hope. So we've been called to a living hope. And we have a right and reverent fear of our Lord as well. And we've also looked at how that love transcends to our relationships with each other, how we love one another sincerely. And Jesus being our cornerstone, or for some, he may be a stumbling stone. And we've also looked at joy. Uh, joy inexpressible, yes, but other parts of the Bible uh, help us to understand that joy that we feel. So uh, during the week, I asked the men's study group um, if there can be someone from that group who, how can they express that joy? And you'd like to sing the song for us? No? Uh, <laughs> I was looking forward to that. <laughs> so you did a solo, did you? Yep. <laughs> Uh, and if you remember last time we had a, a sandwich, a three-part sandwich. So we looked at, is our conduct honourable? Uh, is our conduct commendable before God? And are we living in a right submission to our authorities, however that looks? Government, officials, police officers, fisheries officers, park rangers. Are we living in a submission to our authorities? And the ongoing question that I keep asking is, do you love Jesus? Uh, and how, how does this look in our lives? So for you, is, is Jesus the cornerstone? Or is he a stumbling stone? Uh, for many people in the world, he is a stumbling, a stumbling stone. And every person in the world needs to answer the question, who is Jesus to them? So who is Jesus to you? Is he a liar? Is he a lunatic? So when he, when he spoke about being you know, the, the king, soon coming king and the saviour, was he, was he a lunatic? Was he deluded? Or was he true? And is he Lord? Jesus must be our cornerstone because this is the only hope that we have. Um, and this is why Peter wrote his first letter to the Christians who were in danger of losing their way and they were going to face many trials and persecution for what was to face them. So I'd ask Debbie to come forward for the reading. So Peter wrote, for the Christians, he saw that they were not prepared for the persecution that was coming their way. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Debbie. So I'm not sure how many of you I've told about the story of when I first met Bronwyn. Not, not sure who I've shared this with. <laughs> anyway, so I first met Bronwyn, I think it was at a, um, sort of a serpentine camp for some function. And uh, I think I rocked up and I saw Bronwyn standing with her friends. And I was like, whoa, okay, yep. <laughs> it's quite tall and... She stood out from the crowd, um, but she was going out with someone else at the time. And then, uh, as I got to know her more at church, um, uh, I got to see more of her inner character. Uh, I remember there was one time that we'd have Sunday night church service, and after the church service, you know, you go and talk to each other. I remember looking across the and there was the, the row of girls, and they were all sitting slumped like this, you know, and then Bronwyn was sitting up, all uh, with a great posture. And it must maybe it's my physio mind. I just I just thought, oh, she's got a great posture. <laughs> but it also means uh, I, I saw that um, she held herself well, as well. And there was a few times I think I, I went to talk to her after church, and uh, just talking about our lives, about university, and she shared how she always strived to do the very best she could with her practice. And that, that's when I really started to see her inner character, uh, her strength. And those qualities shine through. So that, yeah, there was the initial attraction, uh, and then you know, as you get to know a person, and you see their inner beauty as well. So when we come to this passage, um, I know some people find this passage a bit controversial. I, I, I don't really. I think I've, I've heard this.
this passage many times before. I've um, it been under this teaching, so it's not controversial to me, but maybe it might be controversial to the world uh, about submission to each other. Because so far in our series we've looked, uh, we've seen that God teaches the Christian how to conduct ourselves in the world, in many domains. So before God, so before our holy God, how are we? Uh, before the world, we need to live as a, an honourable life, to have one that's filled with good works. And as a citizen, we need to submit to our authorities as well. So as we come to chapter 3, we find that there's also certain responsibilities in our relations as husbands and wives. Uh, in this society where there's so many dysfunctional families, um, it's even more imperative that as the people of God, we demonstrate through our families that which is the will of God. So I'll be talking a lot about ongoing transformation. How does that look in our lives? And how is this done in our lives as well? Because I believe we need this ongoing transformation so that we become more and more like Jesus, becoming the people that God originally intended us to be. Not through our own efforts, no, but through God's grace, through God's generous and lavish grace being poured out on us. So last time we looked at how as Christians we are to submit to our government, And in this passage it says, in the same way. So that's the connection between that that passage and this passage about husbands and wives. So it's the same principle, that submission to others. And how does that look? So Paul writes, so Peter writes to the wives, and he says, in the same way, and this refers back to that principle of submission, be submissive to your husbands. And just as it was also talking about slaves and masters, It's talking about submission not just to the good, but also to the harsh or difficult. So if a wife suffers wrong from her husband when she was doing good, then it's commendable before God if she she bears that mistreatment patiently. And we see that submission is also best illustrated uh, where a Christian wife is married to an unbeliever, that he might be converted by her conduct. The first duty of wives as Peter says, is that of submission, especially if the husband is is an unbeliever. He also says to adorn yourselves properly. Now, it's not not wrong to make oneself presentable, um, but we just need to know our priorities, you know, what's our focus, whether it's external or whether it's on the inside. Peter says, don't let your emphasis on beauty pertain to outward adornment. Not that it's wrong to arrange your hair or your clothing, but we need to place our emphasis elsewhere. Let your beauty be the hidden person of the heart. We need to conduct yourselves so the beauty of the inner person is what shines through. Where people notice more who you are rather than what you wear. So it's a gentle and quiet spirit that constitutes true inner beauty. And this is also very precious in the sight of God. So just as I, as I met Roman, there was yes, there was the outward attraction, but as I got to know him more, that's when I saw the inner beauty and strength and character. Submissiveness? Maybe. <laughs> We're all growing, aren't we? <laughs> so Christian women, let your inner beauty be your most noticeable feature. And... Peter also instructs women to be daughters of Sarah. Uh, Remember that the holy women in the Old Testament, they trusted in God. They adorned themselves with a quiet and gentle spirit and they were submissive to their husbands. So the the quoted example is Sarah, uh, who was so beautiful outwardly that Pharaoh wanted her when she was over 65 years old. Uh, And the, the king of the Philistines wanted her when she was over 90 years old, long past the age of childbearing. Yet her beauty was demonstrated by her submissive spirit by calling her husband Lord or or Master. Christian women too, they can be daughters of Sarah, provided they do good and are not afraid of any terror. So to be submissive to their husbands and be composed with a gentle and quiet spirit. So to be considered a daughter of Sarah by God is a very special honour. But a failure to heed these words may result in being more like a daughter of, of Jezebel Remember, she delighted in her physical beauty in manipulating her husband. 
May Christian women profess godliness and wearing the name of Christ at all times. Now, Peter's instructions to husbands are brief, a bit briefer, but nonetheless extremely important. And I think this is where the whole controversy arises. You know, people ask their backup with wives must submit to their husbands. I think people forget it's two sides of the same coin. It goes both ways, doesn't it? Because straight after wives instructed to submit to their husbands, husbands are to love their wives. It goes both ways. Husbands are instructed to dwell with your wives with understanding. Or another translation says with knowledge. Husbands are expected to know and understand their wives. Intimacy. You know, having such an intimate relationship that you just know the other person. Paul, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, Husband, love, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Again, the, the best example for us to model off is Christ and his love. Now, it does say women as the weaker vessels. Now, it's, this is just referring to physical strength. It's pretty easy to work out why. This is not to intellectual abilities or moral courage or spiritual strength. You know, we know that women are very strong in those areas as well. So this understanding is to govern how a husband should live with his wife, with love and thoughtfulness. A husband is also instructed to honour his wife as well. Uh, to honour involves the idea of that which is precious and of high value. So the husband is to assign his wife the honour of being precious and of high value in his sight. And the good reason is this, is because they are truly heirs together of the grace of life. Our sisters in Christ are worthy of the the gospel and worthy of the respect that we give any other child of God. And then Peter says that your prayers may not be hindered. There's a good reason to heed Peter's instruction. Um, the word hindered literally means cut off. We need to make sure that we are loving our wives so that we are not cut off not, uh, and our prayers are not hindered. So from this we learn from Peter how we to conduct ourselves as husbands and wives and how this has a bearing on our personal relationship with God as well. Uh, wives are considered very precious in the sight of God. And husbands are to keep open the avenue of their prayers to God. If we do all this, then we are all heirs together of the grace of life. Now, how do we all relate to each other then? And obviously we're not all married to each other. So how are we to conduct ourselves in right relationship to each other? Again, we've looked at how we define our duties in our relationships uh, with those of the world. Uh, with those of authority above us. Uh, We looked at the servant-master relationship and the husband and wife relationship. So now we go on to how we relate to each other. And Peter defines our duty to each other in Christ. He doesn't just say how we are to relate to each other. He also goes one step further and he says why. He explains why. and He gives us a motivation to fulfil our duties to each other as we read on. We, We are to be of one mind, aren't we? Or uh, another translation says to live harmoniously, so to live in harmony. Did God make us all robots, all pre-programmed with a set of instructions? No, no, he gave us free will, didn't he? So how can we be of one mind if we're all such different people? We are to be united with the same purpose and the same goal. And remember that Jesus prayed for this kind of unity. And remember the church, the early church in Acts, They all came together and they they were oneness in mind. We can have this oneness of mind, I think, if we all submit to the will of God. If we all come under God, then we'll all be on the same page, won't we? So we need to make God's will our will. We need to make God's purpose our purpose. And just in case we need another perfect example of this, we just look look to Jesus Christ who lived a perfect life of submission to God the Father. So we are to be of one mind. We are to have compassion for one another, 
or as another translation says, uh, to be sympathetic. So to have pity, to, to feel for people, uh, to, to share each other's joys and share each other's struggles. But the Christian life is, is not a solo journey. You, know, you can't just worship God in the quietness of your own lounge room just for an hour on a Sunday morning. Uh, the Christian life is a, is a corporate adventure. We share this journey together. And again, some, I think some people think that the Christian life should be all joyful. You know, it should be all victorious and uh, great, and wonderful things happening all the time. I disagree. I think there's the joys and the struggles happening at the same time. So we share those joys and we share those struggles. Such compassion can only come from a tender and loving heart, which is why Peter also says that we need to love as brothers or love one another. This attribute is the key to Christian living. This is essential. If we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and convince the world that we truly are his disciples. That, that is the difference between us and the world. So we just ask the question, do, do you love your fellow brother or sister? Is there someone here this morning that you may have fallen out of love with, that you're struggling with relationship with? Sometimes tough things happen in, in life as we journey through. And feelings of brotherly love might be a bit uh, absent or waning. Or worse, replaced by feelings of resentment or unforgiveness or to harbour a grudge against someone. Do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? We are also instructed to be tender-hearted or kind-hearted. Uh, it's this kind of heart that is compassionate and this is the, the, this is the love that enables us to love our brothers as well. The, the opposite is, is cold-hearted or callous, uh, where a person is insensitive to the needs of each other or of uh, other people. Now, you, you could say that our natural fallen human state is cold-hearted and that it's only in Jesus Christ that we have that radical transformation that enables us to have that tender heart. So have you considered what kind of heart you have? Is it a tender heart? Or is there any cold coldness in your heart? We are also instructed to be courteous or to be humble in spirit. Uh, this, uh, literally, this school to be to be friendly of mind and, and to be kind. Now, this has a few more implications because to be courteous means to show much courtesy to another person, and this would imply a humility of spirit. So the opposite of that is the spirit of pride or, or arrogance. But for an arrogant or, or proud person, does not bother to be courteous, do they? So it's no wonder then that the sin of pride is one of the most destructive aspects of a person, even in people who have been redeemed by God and people who are continuing to be redeemed, people who are still growing in how to put off the old self and to put on the new. So as Christians, we are to imitate our Lord and Saviour. Not think so highly of ourselves. And we need to make sure that we are courteous and kind to others. And lastly, we are to return blessing for evil. So when someone does us evil, we are to respond in kindness and with a blessing. Again, this, this goes against human nature, doesn't it? Look at some parts of the world. <laughs> They've just had hostilities and wars for thousands of years. So that the natural fallen state is to return evil. We are instructed to return blessing. And Peter gives us two reasons why we are to react in this way. We are called to follow the example of Jesus Christ and also that we might receive a blessing from God. Because it is a blessing to be a blessing to others even when there has been damage or hurt. So we have six duties that we are to conduct ourselves with uh, towards our, in our relationships towards one another. And they, these things are, are key, these are essential to Christian living. And this is how we are to grow as we grow as Jesus' disciples. Now, if, if we look at the Christian journey, you know, we're, we're strangers in the world, um, and then we're saved. So being saved is just the start of the journey, but it continues on and on. And as we continue on in our journey, we grow. We grow, becoming more and more 
like God's Son, Jesus Christ. So we know what we are to do. Just sometimes it's hard, isn't it? Because in our human nature, these things don't come naturally. It's only when we put on the new self that we grow in this. So again, this is what we are to do. And Peter gives us the instructions of what to do. He also tells us why. The first motivation is that we might love life and see good days. We all want to have a good life, don't we? None of us want to struggle. Everyone wishes to enjoy life as they experience it. But too often, many people make their own lives miserable by their own self-seeking or self-destructive or selfishness in their attitudes. And how often we see the outcome of people's selfish uh, decisions that they've made in their lives. Uh, constantly complaining, contentious, uh, retaliating. Uh, these people only, only aggravate the situation. David, in his psalm, he gives the secret to loving life and seeing good days. He says, to refrain the tongue from evil and lips from speaking guile. Uh, don't engage in slander, backbiting or complaining, lying, murmuring and grumbling. Because these things don't help a problem, they just make it worse, don't they? We are instructed to do good, to seek peace and pursue it. To do the very kinds of things that Peter tells us in these verses. So the first motivation to do all these things is that we might love life and see good days. The second motivation is that the Lord will be open to us. But only by doing the will of God can we ensure that his gracious eyes will watch over us and his ears will be open to our prayers. Now, if that's not enough, <laughs> so why, why should we live like this? You know, if that, even if that's not enough to convince us, uh, we could look at the opposite way. So what's the opposite of all this? And God has already spoken about this back in Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6. Uh, the writer uh, considers a list of abominations. Now, these are all the opposite of what we just read. Proverbs chapter 6. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community, or a, a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. And it's already been written about before Peter as well. We are to be courteous and humble. We are to be compassionate. We are to be tender-hearted. We are to return good for evil. And we are to be of one mind. If we want the Lord to watch over us, if we want him to heed our prayers, let us be sure to fulfil our duties to each other as we relate to one another well. And I believe if we do so, we'll enjoy life to the fullest and see good days, even on this pilgrimage here on earth, even though we await the blessed hope that is coming. So I've been asking the question, do you love Jesus? And now we come to the point where Jesus answers that question. If we read John chapter 14, Jesus says many things, and he says, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live you also will live. On that day you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them, and make a home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. 
So three times Jesus has said, if you love me, keep my commands. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. I mean, that's the nail on the coffin, isn't it? That, that's the reason why we are to love each other and to relate to each other well. So do you love Jesus? <laughs>